me a very short time ago with all this uh, injustice and sometimes the guilty get away and all these things that are going on. Sometimes the guiltless get, and the righteous get caught up in that. How can God allow that to happen? So as soon as I heard that, I immediately thought of a passage. And I've got to tell you the answer to that is I have no answer to that. But I can shed a lot of light on it. The passage that came to my mind, it happens to be in Matthew chapter 20, uh, 23. And it's at the very end of that chapter. And it reads, Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, I, probably you're sitting there saying, I don't understand. That doesn't help me at all understand how the guiltless, the righteous, get caught up in this. It sounds to me like it's what we call collateral damage. If there's a president and I'm a terrorist and I want to take the president out, I may plant a bomb right next to him, but there's people around that may get maimed, injured, or, or killed. Those are what we call collateral damage. And it would be easy to say that the guiltless, the righteous people who get caught up and get, uh, get caught up into God's judgment when he takes out those wicked ones, it's just collateral damage. And that'd be farthest from the truth. The Bible is riddled with the answer. How you interpret it's up to you, but I will place it in front of you. So as I was thinking about that line, and again the line in Matthew 23, 36, Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. That's in red. Christ speaks it. I happened to be reading this book, and this is what prompted our talk tonight. Uh, it's a book from, printed in October 1803. It's from a Reverend Andrew Lee. He was up in Lisbon, Connecticut. He wrote a book, the one that I know of, um, Various Important Subjects of the More Difficult Passages in the Sacred Volume. And it truly is a very difficult passage to understand that, what it's trying to say. Even if you read before and after, you're going to be lost if you don't have a foundation. So I thought I would take you through how we get to some of this of an understanding and attempt to give you foundation to understand how to even address that question because it's very common in Christianity that we get that. If you have a God, how can he let people suffer, go hungry, die, have cancer? Are you serious? I wouldn't want that God. So in this book, it being a difficult uh, passage, it's ironic that his last sermon addresses just that passage. So I'm going to, if you'll forgive me, be bouncing from this book, from notes, from scripture, and I'll just piece it as I go and we'll get what we get. But I promise by the time we're done, we'll at least have something to fall back on. How can we be answerable for so much wickedness of past generations? That's where we are. I certainly wasn't around at the time of Cain and Abel. So I don't expect to ever be held responsible. Give me a break already. Of course, women could say the same thing. I wasn't around at the time of Adam and Eve. And yet when I get, have childbirth, I guess what it says in Genesis, I'm having to be plagued with. So, With this being said, in order to solve this riddle of this being held accountable scenario and collateral damage, if you will, we first of all got to start in, in two distinct areas. First of all, we have to break man down into two areas, obviously, individual and as a member of a community. And the reason I get a little nervous about this is that it's going to take a little bit of thought process as we go. I'll connect the dots. It's not hard to understand. But we came here for Wednesday night sermon, which means I'm just going to kick back and whatever I get, I get. And that won't be tonight. So if we break man down into two distinct areas, individual and community, we already are 50% of the way there of at least getting to some answer that makes sense. Now, once I do that, 
What we're going to concentrate on here are basically four areas, and we're going to blend those together just a little. We're going to hit families, large communities, the nation, and the world. That's how we're going to make sense of where we are. I promise you everything in the Bible falls under one of those four categories. Families, which would be individuals, heads of families, large communities, communities like what we sit in today, and as this community gets bigger, as a community got larger in the inception of the United States, it all of a sudden became, it was a nation to begin with, but what made it the nation? The communities. So then we'll go from communities which will bleed into nations, and then we must take a look at the world. Because they are all addressed in the Bible. Yes, our passage is from Matthew, but Christ is talking about a lot of this from the Old Testament. And he's only talking about people. So with that being said, we can obviously start off with the very first family type member, Adam and Eve. And I started to talk about it, Adam and Eve. Obviously, sin was created. They had it at one time. Uh, once sin was created, then some things were taken away and some new laws were laid down that they were going to have to uh, pertain to, death becoming one of those, sorrow, pain, guilt, all things that they should never have had to experience. And all, ever since that happened, everything that was common to their race became partakers in that. And I set that up first, being in Genesis is fine, but I set that up because everything has to come off of what that is. Not Adam and Eve, but the scenario that you set things in motion... People and things around you obviously may get affected. We talk about the ripple in the water scenario. That's where we're going tonight. And you're going to see God having to deal with this constantly. It's his long suffering and his mercy that is almost unfair. It goes on forever. But what I like to talk about is the full measure and the season of God. It is the full measure that brings him to a specific point. And you're going to see this full measure work in many different ways. And it is that full measure that starts to bring clarity to this question of why people get engulfed in what's going on. We're the beloved people of, of God, of course. He wants no harm to us. So obviously, if we start off with family, what we're trying to establish here that it's heads of families that can affect the entire family. Gosh, Scott and I have children. We realize that sometimes we have to make a decision for the family that's best for the family. And we attempt to do that at all costs. We would rather have harm come to ourselves. If you have children or you don't, you can pretty much understand that. I'd rather have harm come to me than my dog or my family. Absolutely. But sometimes we make decisions that are based on self. And sometimes what I call collateral damage begins to happen. And sometimes we don't even realize when we make a decision, it doesn't even come to fruition that going off the righteous path, beginning to affect our family for years to come. As a matter of fact, generations to come. Obviously, how I live is an example, is what we want to do. And if there is a lack of an example, some families grow up and they have no uh, father figure in them. And that lack of example does show up at times. Certainly, when Abel was murdered, Cain should have been the only one that took the brunt of this. And it wasn't. Cain's family took the brunt of this. 
The land itself that Cain was to tend and to thrive and flourish with, which was happening while Abel was alive, also revolted against him and his family. I thought we were talking about people. I said the world. Animals, land, prosperity. So that's where we're headed with this. I'll read some scripture along the way, if I may. For we must all, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, we, for, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether it be good or bad. We're going to be in front of Christ, and I want to say it now so I don't forget it. We're going to be answering for how well we used the gifts and talents that are given us. Not necessarily did you show up on church every week. What did you do while you were there? Did you forward it on? Did you show obedience? Was Christ the first thing that you want to bring into a stranger, a Gentile if you will? What did you do? My wife said it best before I came up here. She says to me, you get to go stand up front tonight and use your gift and talent. And it's exactly one of the things that you'll be judged on. Well, I can't stand and talk. You got a talent, you got a gift, God made sure of it. What it is, and if you don't know, search. Because if you never use it, it's easy to say God will just take it away. No. He didn't give it to you for no reason at all. All things come alike to all. Get this concept, good or bad. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked. To the good and to the clean and to the unclean. To him that sacrifice and to him that sacrifices not. As is the good, so is the sinner. They're alike. And he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. They're both the same. The same God brings the same things to you, gives you the same inheritance. It's no different. That's Ecclesiastes 9.2. So, being this that we're on the family, if you will, the similar consequences, and I won't go into it, are Ham and Esau. You can read their stories. It's their families that got caught up. We're not saying that the people in the family were all wicked, not by any means. This is a part of scripture that talks about the ground itself for Cain, Cain's family. The ground, cursed for his sin, did not yield to them its strength, and they were deprived of those religious instructions which they would have no doubt have received had their father dwelt in the presence of the Lord. Even the religious instruction were withheld from his family simply because of how he acted, for whatever reason. I'm not judging him for what he did. I got no clue how and why he got there. But I am saying even the religious instruction, Abel was phenomenal at that. Didn't do very good on his chores. But man, he had a beeline for God. Cain wasn't quite so, but he was at least in the presence of it. I prefer you to be in here even if you sleep half the time than if you just stand out on the street and do nothing. That's where I'll, I'm going with that. Also, we have princes, uh, just before we get into the community, we have those princes, uh, principalities of Israel. That's the ugly part, Judah and Israel. Their families alone got torn down because of their actions. Now, of course, they're in big government. That's like I'm in, in uh, Washington. I'm in big government. And their families alone, because of their actions, that they thought that they just kept to themselves, the young ones, the wives, 
the sons and daughters that were older, all got torn into this. And what happens is eventually, they want to pay the price and generations became affected with God's judgment. That's where I'm going with this. This is about God exacting judgment. This isn't about, okay, they were deprived. God stepped out. Their measure, their full measure had time to accumulate. And when the time is enough, and enough is accumulated, no matter what you do in repentance, it won't turn back the clock. That's where I'm going. Now, we're still trying to answer the question you're still stuck on. What about those that got, like, collateral damage? And I'm trying to show you that God is looking at this as a whole. Could there ever be a time, even when the innocent get caught up, and it's better to clear it off and start again? Of course you know the answer to that. In an interest of time, we'll go into communities. So now in communities, morals are necessary uh, for large communities as well as individuals. We already know that. As a matter of fact, morals are the health and strength of a community. While they remain, while their morals remain, no enemy can prevail against it. Obviously, in our nation, we have a lack of morals. We have a line that's been blurred. That's our problem. I don't at least go out and commit any offenses. I've not uh, broken any laws. The difference between the individual and the community is the time and place. Obviously, a community is here on earth. When we have lack of moral, it becomes a judgment and a reward. Obviously, a community is a judgment on earth. An individual will gain a reward in heaven. But the lack of morals is still there. Or the positiveness of the morals. Sodom and her daughter, that's how they refer to it. That's Gomorrah. Two little petty kingdoms. They don't mean much. But they accumulated enough ugliness throughout the timeline that their cup became full to a point, and it took a long time, to a point where God said enough is enough. There's not a thing you can do to go back and clean off that slate, repentance or not, obedience or not. Now, we do know that there was some areas called Nineveh where they gave them, God gave them time. Not Sodom and Gomorrah. The seed of Jacob. That was filled with national guilt. Ten tribes, Israel. Ten tribes, Israel. Beautiful and prosperous. All said, we turn away from God. And it's documented. All throughout the Old Testament, what they did. Ten tribes. The only two tribes that were halfway decent were Jerusalem, uh, uh, Judah. These ten tribes said, not only do we turn away, we're going to go out of our way to follow our own path. And it wasn't just, we're going to give it a shot. They became wicked. The national guilt is what we're talking now. They filled their cup so full of a national guilt measure that nothing could turn it back. God said, I'd had enough. 250 years he gave Israel to change their ways, turn back. He made them so prosperous during that 250 years, they were looked at of, of one of the most mega cultures around. 250 years, they had done enough. There wasn't a thing that was going to save them at one point. And that's when God said, judgment's coming. My prophets, every time they come near you, you kill them. They're bringing you the message. Assyria is going to come down. Flat out told them. 130 years later, Judah, the two tribes southern, Jerusalem, same thing happens. 130 years later. The sore, the cancer that came down from Israel impregnated Judah. But Judah had something that was even more wicked than that. Personal sins along, alone, personal sins alone of all these leaders could not 
have brought these two nations down. All those corrupt people could not have brought the nations down. That's what's told here. What brought them down was the guilt, the national guilt, all the other people in the nation. Now when you start measuring that cup and filling it up, it gets to a point, it's full. And once it gets full, there is no turning back. That's what we're trying to say here. Yes, the ones that were guiltless, that are righteous, you're in a community. We elect our leaders. We say yes to you. Then we say go to Washington and we step back and we go back to ESPN, at least I do, and, and farming and whatever. The bush hogging, I don't farm. I'm guiltless. He's the one that made the decision. Okay, I voted him in. I apologize. Doesn't matter. We're all together. It was the guilt of the nation that brought it down. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Forgiving. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation, Numbers 14, 18. I kid you not. God is making it very well known. I will punish generations for what's happened in the past. We're all so worried about the climate. Gosh, I don't want to, and the national budget. I, how many times do I hear it? I don't want to leave my kids with that budget. But it's okay if I leave my kids with murder on their hands of about 60 million of God's children. I don't think of that. But I promise you, there is a generation that will pay for that. Once the cup gets full, but right now, it's probably about two-thirds of the way full. There will be an innocent generation, maybe five from now, that will say, I had nothing to do with that. I even voted it out when it came up. Doesn't matter. That's what God is saying. Matters not to me. Righteousness exalts a nation, but wickedness degrades and destroys it. And that's what happens to nations. And if we're not careful, we may not be wiped out, but we may be close to having terrorism live here. And then we can't even meet in public anymore and exalt God. But what really came about was Manasseh. He was the worst of the worst. Manasseh came down, and what was the sin of Manasseh? He was a manipulator. But the biggest problem with Manasseh, he had blood on his hands to his own kind. They say that the blood, they, we talk about the ground being moist. The blood was so thick of killing his own kind that we talk about the red ground being moist. That's how bad the blood was from Manasseh. Then the Lord said to me, even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not go out to this people, his own kind, his, his chosen people, the Jews. Send them away from my presence. Let them go. If they ask you, where shall we go? Tell them. This is what the Lord says. Those destined for death, to death. Those for the sword, to the sword. Those for starvation, starvation. This is God talking. Those for captivity, captivity. This was the time of Manasseh. These are the people who have nothing to do with government. He's telling it to all. Yes, the government's coming down. Send the people with them. I will send four kings of destroyers against them, the killers of the Lord, the sword will kill, and the dogs to drag away, and the birds, the wild animals to devour and destroy. I will make them abhorrent, to all the kingdoms of the earth. Remember, these are the chosen people and the rest of the Gentiles knew it. Why? Of what Manasseh, son of he uh, King Hezekiah of Judah, did in Jerusalem. God is saying it. The measure of crimes was full. You couldn't add a thing to it. I'm a Jew, I get it. 
I live in, the, in, in Judea, I get it. But why should I pay that price? Because I didn't say something against it? In the 600th year of Noah came a point where God had to bring the deluge. That's the term we use. It's the only time that he wiped out the face of the earth. You don't think there were righteous people in there at that time? Of course. Following God? Of course. The only thing you could have prayed and hoped is that your heart was right, right with Christ because you were going. You didn't wind up at the door as Mo, uh, Noah was closing it. You didn't make it in. You were gone. God thought cleansing my world was better than anything else. All. Still doesn't answer, but I'm not quite sure an answer is what we're looking for anymore, as opposed to, I better get right with Christ. Because when, this is what I think of Christianity today. Gosh, Terry, just tell me what I need to do to get into the gates. Well, you need to profess Christ in your heart. Perfect. So I get to the gates. D don't you want to make sure Christ is there? I don't care if Christ is there. You tell me how to get in. That's Christianity today. And if God catches that in your heart, I promise you, think twice about walking in those gates. You may be the one that he says, I got no clue who the heck you are. I don't know where you're from. It don't matter to me. But you will live forever, but you're going to be a little hot, my friend. I could read more about Manasseh, but why? Who cares? The part that I love is revelation. Of course, we've gone from the individual, the household member of the family, to the larger community, to the nation, and then to the world. And God will take care of the world. I use Noah. But the one I love is in Revelation. Oh, the time is right for the harvesting. You've heard that one, right? In Revelation. And most people think that means us. I'm, I'm the righteous guy. That's the harvest. Whoa, did you miss that one? I'll read it for you. I looked and there before me, I'm in Revelation chapter 14, 14 through 20. I looked and there, and there before me was a white cloud. And seated on the cloud was one like son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its, its grapes are ripe. And I've heard people say, I, want, I know I'm the grape. You nutcase. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the, as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 strata. That's 180 miles. The, the blood was about this high. So, with this new tool that you have called knowledge and wisdom, I say, let's try it. Let's read all of chapter 23. Now that you know the weight, when Christ walked up there and stood on the cross, you know what he had to take on. It wasn't just the Jews of the day. Chapter 23, then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, everybody thinks this is about Pharisees. What you just realized is the weight. 
saying, verse 2, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. What he's saying is, you all of a sudden think you are the, char the one in charge of making the law and distributing it. Remember, Moses was in charge of that. A great weight. Pharisees and Sadducees seem to think that they're the ones who are handling that. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. This is all Christ speaking about the Pharisees and Sadducees. But he's talking about the rest of the world. First of all, the family, the community, the nation, and the world, the Gentiles. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders. What could that mean? All the wickedness that they create, they have laid on your shoulders. That's what that means. He's speaking very plainly so they understand. He's talking to a heck of a lot of Jews right now. Those were the first churchgoers. They tie up heavy burdens and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. More wickedness, more killing, more bloodshed. It doesn't matter as long as we gain farther than anybody else. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. Notice not one thing they are doing is to exalt God anymore. It's so that I am looked at as some guy who can stand up in front of a podium and drink water while you watch me and speak. For they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. Phylacteries. It is in the Bible. Deuteronomy. Exodus. A box goes here every day. Do two prayers of Deuteronomy. A box goes here and they're used long uh, leather, leather bands, and somebody's got to tie it on, and somebody's got to tie it on. That is in the Bible. But the problem is, they're Pharisees. They're Sadducees. I want to make sure my tassels look really cool. Those are called phylacteries, and they're in the Bible. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogue. And even today, not just the synagogue, you can pay for your seats. The closer you get, the more they cost. And respectful greetings in the marketplace. Uh, as I walk, I want to make sure people respect me with their greetings as they talk with me. That gets me going. And being called rabbi by men. That's not saying preacher. That's saying teacher. Rabbi. Oh, you think I'm a teacher? Hey, thank you. Hey, could you say that a little bit louder so the guys over there can hear? Call me rabbi again. I even pay you four shekels. Give me a big rabbi as I walk by. Oh, yeah. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, meaning God, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. He's got his disciples in front of him. He's got people all around him. And Christ is saying this aloud. Oh, man, he's ruffling feathers at this moment. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader. That is Christ. Now the humble section, the next two verses. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. He's talking about himself. Again, he's talking to his disciples. And the people around. But the greatest among you shall be your servant, he's saying. He's giving them what his love is about. Christ's love is about servitude. Whoever exalts him has, himself shall be humbled. Meaning, this world will be leveled. We know when that's going to happen with Christ. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. They can't, they can't understand that concept. These people of wealth, the people who pervert the justice system, they'll go after the widows and they'll take their, their estates from them. Legally. Just cost me a few shekels. No big deal. And here come the, uh, the next eight, here come eight woes. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. Why do they shut off the kingdom of heaven? Obviously, 
Everything is about on the take and thinking they'll never be judged. I have too much wealth, I'll be dead, and who cares? For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. In other words, what they teach people will never allow them to get to heaven. That's what he means by, nor do you allow those who are entering to actually go in, to get to heaven. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, you make long prayers in front of everybody. There are several times a day that we pray. They have these shawls that are around them. So they'll cover their head so they can pray if they're out in public. But let me make sure I can see everybody looking. Oh, there are, there's nine, nine guys coming by. Let me give you a good prayer now. Nice and loud. For you make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Christ is saying, go ahead, speak loudly in your actions, not by voice, and you'll receive a double measure of condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. What does that mean? Changing generally in religious, from a heathen nation to the Jewish culture. Well, what's wrong with that? They're bringing them to God. So what is wrong with that? They're bringing them into their heathen culture that should have been about God and making it about everything else. Idols, false worship, prostitutes in the temple, on and on and on. Bloodshed from your king to your very people. And when he becomes one, meaning Christ is saying, and when you do have somebody you bring into the light, your darkness of light, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. He, the person you bring in is thirstier than all heck and you feed him sand. Woe to you, blind guides. Who could that be? False prophets, false teachers, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. Be careful here. I'll explain what we're going. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? They're telling the people, we have a very wealthy synagogue, you want to be here. What's more important, your wealth or the very place God dwells, is what he's saying, who even gave you the wealth. And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. Let me explain. You blind men, which is more important? The offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? This is a church today. Christ is taking a stab at the very church at that moment. You are bringing them in, perverting them. You are killing them. You are not preparing them for God. You are taking their eye off of what matters. Mega churches today, bring the tithes in. We want to talk about a very uh, difficult passage. Don't you dare talk about a difficult passage there. Love and kumbaya. Then they give more at the altar. You need a Starbucks? We got it. It's on our website. Therefore, Whoever swears by the altar, swears both by the altar and by everything on it. You don't have to care about the tithings that are there. You only have to care about the place of God. Where can I find God? That's what you should be asking in the church that you walk into. Is God there? Do I feel it? Do I hear the word of God? I hear something. Get out. And whoever swears by the temple swears by both the temple and by him, meaning God, who dwells within it. And whoever swears by heaven, swears by both the throne of God and by him, meaning Christ, who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin. They used to do that. That was 
not what they, the, there were normal tithes. This was above and beyond. And you're going to see that in the last line. They, this is above, the, this little mint and dill and cumin is like, wow, that's a rich guy that has spices. Wow, he was supposed to give some of that. For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, meaning all that other stuff you were supposed to tithe. Justice, here's what the law says. Justice and mercy and faithfulness. They should be tithing those to others who don't understand it. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You should have always focused on those things because that was law. And that's why God laid it so that you, it would help you in your walk with God, which is now Christ. I don't think God ever said, forget about the justice because it was in the Old Testament. And if he did, that's probably why we got perverted today in our justice system. You blind guides who strain out a gnat. One little thing uh, gets in your way and you swallow a camel. You know the log in the eye one? That's what he's saying. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup. You know this one. And of the dish. But inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. He's saying it right to their face. Now they know that. Everybody else knows that's what's going on. This ain't nothing new. Everybody knows about the corruption. They care more about the appearance on the outside than what's actually in their heart. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Remember we talked about the altar. Worry about the altar and everything falls in line. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which on the outside appear beautiful. Back then when you owned a tomb, you paid somebody to go whitewash it so it stood out and looked cute. That's what he's saying. For you are like whitewashed tombs which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. You, you can never, a Pharisee and, and Sadducee could never go near anybody that died. Even their own family member, they become unclean immediately. Now they got to go through a ritual to get cleansed again. That's why the moment you mention bones, don't go there. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men. That's why this whitewashed thing on them, he's saying, you appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And it is the lawlessness that brought the judgment from God. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. You act like you're doing everything the right way. And say, <coughs> if we had been living in the days of our fathers we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. That's an insult. He's telling them why they're paying for the price, that, that line at the end. All the stuff that you're doing today is even worse than your father's. And they're and he's saying, you want to say to me, because he knows their mind, that if we were around during our fathers, we never would have shed blood. Manasseh, current. So you testify against yourselves. Christ is saying you are sinking yourselves when you make that statement. That you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. The mo be Why would he say that? I've told you. It is prophesied, I read it to you from God, that three and four generations will pay the price for you. The moment they said we are sons of those fathers, whatever those fathers did that would bring judgment, they will pay for. 32. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. So now Christ is saying, go ahead, put all the measure of your fathers that comes to here. And then put all the measure of your guilt it comes to here. We're done. There's no more that you can put in that bottle. Just to get to the last line. 
You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. He's talking about himself. Now he's going to talk about his disciples. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That's his disciples that are standing right there. So that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth. He's telling him you are about to take on the weight of everything that's happened from Genesis till that moment. From the blood of the righteous, Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of, and it's in English, so I'm going to do the best I can, but I'm going to explain this. But the son of Bereshia, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Why is that line important? From Abel to Zechariah, it's not the prophet. Although funny, the prophet Zechariah had the exact father with uh, had the father with the exact same name. But why is he saying that? Because the murder of this Zechariah happened in Second Chronicles. Why is that important? Where did Abel get killed? Genesis. Where did this Zechariah get killed? Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles is the last book of the Hebrew Bible. From the beginning to the end, you are taking the weight of every murder in between. The Alpha and Omega. From the beginning to, that, to the end, because it was their Jewish Bible they understood. You'll pay for every one of those. Which then brings us to the last line. Truly. I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, does it make sense? That's all that he's saying. He went through a whole chapter to let them know, you will atone for everybody. Why? Because I'm about to atone for all those sins also, so that we can move on with life. Questions or comments?